All right, so welcome again in this class of uh, bonding theories in transition metal complexes. H. In the previous classes, what we have been discussing is the very basic that uh, very basic properties of the uh, transition metal complexes in general, right? Their nomenclature and uh, very initial experiments done by Warners and followed by the development of valency bond theories, right? And um, then we have taken various examples that how valency bond theory came up with the explanations of uh, some of the property of transition metal complexes. Here we are again, as I told you that uh, in the valency bond theory, although it gives some information about the geometry, the number of bonds, uh, shape, and to some extent it explains the magnetic properties, uh, basically just number of unpaired electrons, right? And uh, yes, to some extent high spin and low spin nature of the transmetal complexes. However, still the large uh, number of properties of transmetal complexes like color, the spectra, structure, stability, reactivity, you know, splitting of the orbitals, effect of ligand types, right? All these properties are still remain unexplained, right? So what need to be done? We need to go ahead and uh, discuss more bonding theories in transmetal complexes, right? So I started explaining a bit of crystal field theory, right? I told you that uh, crystal field theory has now largely replaced valency bond model because this is just much more useful and much more easier to understand and uh, explain various properties of transition metal complexes, right? I told you that if you would like to understand the D or the uh, crystal field theory, which uh, the very important part is that we understand how the d orbital splittings takes place in uh, different geometries, in different uh, uh, geometries of the metal complexes. Okay, if you understand that, it will be very easy for us to explain the property of transition metal complexes. So, keeping that in mind, okay, you need to understand very well the shape of the d orbitals. So there are five d orbitals. As you can see the dj square, which I told you that it is a combination of two orbitals, dj square minus x square and dj square minus y square. Okay, and it is represented like this, which have a you know the lobes along with the z axis, major lobes are along with the z axis, right? And then you have a donut in this uh, x and y plane, right? So any orbital, any ligand. So any ligand coming along with the jet direction is going to affect the energy of dj square orbital much more than any other uh, 5d orbitals, any other 5d orbitals, okay. Similarly, dx square minus y square, if they are ligands coming along the x and y axis and x and y axis, then those ligands will affect the energy of this orbital maximum. Okay, if uh, the other three orbitals are in between the axis, right? So the ligands which are coming or affecting or coming along the axis will not be affecting these orbitals much because they, will, they, they are not going to directly interact with these orbitals. However, if the ligands are coming in between the axis, then these are the other ligands which are going to be affected more. And the other two, d x z square and d x square minus y square orbital, they are not going to be affected that much. If ligands are not coming along the axis, if they are coming in between the axis, right? So I told you that assumptions of the d in the crystal field theory is uh, you know to explain is basically to explain how d orbital splitting takes place, okay? And the few assumptions that I told you that in this model, because this model was developed, keeping in mind the crystal field theory, that, that the crystal field theory was actually developed for the crystals, right? So crystals is generally uh, majorly common for the ionic solids, right? 
So it was assumed that these uh, ligand and metal bonding is also ionic bonding. So purely electrostatic attraction between the ligands and the metal. However, all of you know that that is not the case. There is some extent of covalent uh, bonding, and that is why some of the properties, very few properties, although were not explained by the crystal field theory, that were explained by the molecular orbital theory that we will be discussing in details later. So ligands are regarded as point charges, and ligands either they are having negatively charged, so they will have the ion ion interaction with the positively charged metal ions, okay, or there will be uh, you know the ligands are neutral, then there will be ion dipole interaction. Okay, metal ions are considered as Lewis acid, ligands are considered as Lewis base. The electrons on the metals are under repulsive uh, forces from those on the ligands. That's we have to understand. This is the factor responsible for the uh, why the splitting takes place because there is a repulsion. Okay, that we will see. And the electrons on the metal would like to occupy those d orbitals which are farthest away, means the distance is maximum from the approach of ligands. That will be the stable, most stable system. So, this is what the assumptions of the uh, crystal field theory are. If you understood how the d orbital shape is, okay, and uh, the directionality of the d orbitals, if you understood, you will be able to appreciate the how the orbital splitting takes place under different geometries. <coughs> With that, let's proceed further. What is a symmetric field? Symmetric field is nothing but assume that uh, there is a metal or metal ion, right, having empty orbitals which can accept electrons, right, and ligands are approaching it. Right. There are 5 d orbitals, and unless ligands are approaching, there will be remaining region rate. Right? Once the ligands are approaching, however, ligands are approaching from a distance, so this field is not enough to cause the splitting. However, the energy of all the d orbitals will increase. Like they are here, once the symmetric field, this means ligands are approaching, all the 5 d orbitals will be increasing energy. Right. This is like, uh, as I generally give the example that you are just having information, let's say there is a group of people inside the room, they are just having the information that there is some attack or some threat is there, they are under attack. So, immediately the anxiety or the energy of all the people in the room will increase. Right? Because unless the attack has taken place, after the attack is taking place, depending on from which direction, the attack is taking place, right? Some people will be attacked more, some people may not be attacked, that way, right? Similar thing happens over here. Initially, all the 5D orbitals, when the ligands are at a certain distance, they are not affecting them differently, there will be a symmetric field will be generated. Okay. Now, somebody might ask that then if they are all under repulsion, then why the complex is being formed? So I want to make it clear over here that when the ligands and metals are at very much distance, there is no contact at all, right? They are everything at very high energy. Separated metal and ligands are at this energy level. And once they are into close contact, there will be electrostatic attraction. That is the biggest, you know, that uh, energy factor. Everything will be because of this electrostatic attraction. Everything in the system will come under a lot of energy will be released. It will be coming under a more stable system will be formed. Once the ligands will approach further, then only this splitting and all this, you know, that, so this, the blue level again, this is after this symmetric field. And after the ligands are approaching more to each and every orbital differently, then this splitting will take place because some of the orbitals are facing ligands more closely, some of them are not facing that closely, so their energy will be different. That is basically the heart, at the heart of the crystal field theory. If you understood this fact that there is electrostatic, is electrostatic attraction, everything will come down in energy, then ligands will come slightly more close to the metal, so the, all the 5D orbitals will be slightly, you know, going up in energy, right? And then, the splitting will take place once the uh, or electrons uh, on the metal and electrons on the uh, ligands will be interacting more. 
Okay, so now as you have understood the assumption of the crystal field theory, just to replace it again, that I told you the d orbitals were like separate, separate. This is dz square, this is z square minus y square, right? Like this, but in actual, all the d orbital, five d orbitals are at one place, right? Like they are in this box, right? And ligands are approaching from like say various directions, as you can see in this figure, right? Very nicely descriptive, like all five d orbitals are here, right? So obviously, some of the ligands are you know, some of the orbitals are facing the ligands directly, some of the ligands are facing the ligands, not indirectly. Like for example, it is shown over here that you know, rather than a spherical field, when it is not a spherical field anymore, discrete point charges, that is ligands, are allowed to interact with the metal. The degeneracy of the d orbitals is removed, right? First, this is it, and there is no, uh, right? All five d orbitals are uh, first at this level. Then there is a symmetric field will be formed, so all are energy in high, and then uh, some of the orbitals will be high in energy, some will be low in energy, splitting will take place uh, as a consequence, as a consequence, you know, of the uh, this repulsion of the ligand orbitals and the d orbitals electrons. Right. This is the splitting of the d orbitals energy, and its consequences are at the heart of crystal field theory. Not all d orbitals will interact to the same extent with the six point charges located in the plus x minus x plus y minus y plus z minus z. As simple as that. The orbitals which lie along these axes will be destabilized more than the orbitals which lie in between the axes if the ligands are approached along the axis. Right? So now with that, let's take the case of the octahedral complexes. All right. So octahedral complexes, as I told you, this is the free metal ion, and there is a spherical uh, charged field. You can see that all the ligands are just approaching. The electrons of the ligands are shown just like a sphere. And after that, once these are approaching more, and if the octahedral crystal field will be formed, then what will happen? Because in case of octahedral, ligands are approaching, you know, uh, along the axis. Right, octahedral symmetry, like is very similar to this, like in the cube, right? And ligands are approaching from the center of each face. So, in that way, they are approaching along the axis, and only the orbitals which are along the axis, that is dx square minus y square and dz square, they will be raised in energy, while the other three, dx, y, dx, z, dy, right, they will be uh, stabilized to the same extent. Right. So, 5D orbitals, because some of them are facing ligands directly, so energy is high, some of them are not facing ligands directly, they are lower in energy. So, splitting has taken place. This splitting is represented as delta O, that is delta octahedral, right? Delta O is a very common word. Also represented as 10 d cube, which is basically energy unit, okay? And uh, this is the energy level which is before splitting, right? That energy level is called as barycenter. This barycenter will be defined as zero energy level now. From this energy level, that this dx square minus y square and dz square in the octahedral symmetry, they are represented as eg set E and G because they just the octahedral is a symmetric uh, nature. It is symmetry is there, so it's called girade. And d orbitals are symmetric, so this is called a girade. E is coming from the symmetry uh, uh, notion for the these two orbitals which are degenerate. So it's called an EG set. And this is the three d three d orbitals are here: x y d x y d x z d y z. These are represented as t two g. So t is for basically three orbitals are there, and t two is the symmetric term, and g is for the symmetry. Uh, because it is centrosymmetric. This geometry is centrosymmetric. Okay. As I told you, so you please understand the terminology over here. EG is for these two orbitals which are above the barycenter, dx square minus y square and dz square. T2G is used for these three orbitals, dx, y, dx, z, dy, z. Right? Barycenter is the energy level uh, just before the splitting has taken place. Okay. That is called the barycenter. 
and this uh, separation between the T2G and EG level is called as delta O or delta octahedral or 10 d cube. Right? The energy from the very center of this level is plus 0 0.6 delta O, while the energy of the 3D orbitals which are lying below the very center, the T2G level, that is minus 0 0.4 delta O or 4 d cube. And the energy of this uh, either 0 0.6 delta O or 6 d cube plus 0 0.6 delta O minus 0 0.4 delta O. Right? So if an electron is occupying you know this orbital, so compared to the very center, they are now occupying a lower energy level, right? That means there is a stabilization. However, if an electron is occupying the EG set, there is a destabilization. All right. So these are the, the six localized points, charges, octahedral field is generated. This is how the splitting has taken place, right? So you see the two ligands, the axis are pointing at ligands, pointing at ligands are the these two orbitals, pointing between ligands are these three orbitals, okay? So generally these are the terms that they are used, A and B are used for singly degenerate labels, single orbitals, E is for double degenerate, T, T generally used for triple degenerate, okay? So anywhere you will see there are two energy levels, okay, two orbitals at same energy level, right, so double degenerate, you will see E term coming from symmetry. If there are three orbitals, you will be changing the T term. If there is only one orbital, either A or B. Okay. G is where there is a symmetric, uh, symmetrical around origin. Okay. U is when anjirabe, that is unsymmetrical about origin. Okay. If you understood all this terminology, it will be very easy for you to understand the entire uh, you know, case to field splitting of different, different D orbitals and the different geometries. All right. Moving from here, let's see that was in the octahedral field. How about tetrahedral field? In tetrahedral field, please note that if there is, a, let's say, there is a cube, the ligands, while in case of the octahedral, they were approaching from the center of the face. In this case, ligands are approaching from the alternative corners of the cube. Okay, alternative corners of the cube. So there are eight corners, but only four ligands from the alternative corners. Okay. And you know the tetrahedral geometry, that uh, tetrahedral geometry, the angle is uh, 109 uh, degree 28 minutes, right? So now, the two E orbitals point to the center of the face of the cube, while the three T2 orbitals point to the center of the edges of the cube. So it's a different compared to the octahedral geometry. So what is happening in this case, because ligands are approaching from the alternate corners, they are not affecting any of the d orbitals directly. So what is happening? The two orbitals, the you know, therefore the angle between E orbitals, metal and ligand is one half of the tetrahedral angle, 109.28 divided by 2, so 54. Right? E orbitals. That means the two orbitals which are which are away from the away from the direction of the approach of the ligands are at 54.44. Right angle, and the other the T two orbitals, metal and ligand angle is 109.28 divided by 3, 35.16. So which one is closer? Obviously the lower angle is 35.16. They are closer to the approach of the uh, lines. Right. So energy of the T two set will be that is d x z d x y and d x y. These three orbitals d x y d x z d y z. These three orbitals are closer to the ligands, while the dx square minus y square and dz square at a slightly more distance, right? So the energy of the, which will be high, energy of T2 will be high, energy of E will be low, right? Because ligands are approaching differently in this case, right? So this is how it is that uh, the 5D orbitals, okay? Uh, the figure is, has to be corrected, this 5 orbitals will be over here. Right, very center is not reflected over here, so it's not a correct figure. But please understand that these are e, these are the T2 uh, will go up in energy and E will go down in energy. Right. 
delta t that is the splitting of the 5d orbitals in the tetrahedral field is represented by delta t is less than delta o why why it is less than delta o because splitting depends on the how much repulsion between the ligand uh, uh, electrons and the metal electrons right so if number of ligands will be more then obviously the repulsion will be more right if the direction of the approach of the ligands is closer or direct with the orbitals then obviously the splitting will be more so delta t is less than delta o in fact in general delta t and delta o there is a relation delta t is equal to 4 by 9 of delta o almost like half basically 4 by 9 is equal to, almost equal to half why this from where this 4 by 9 figure is coming that there are only four ligands instead of six in case of tetrahedral compared to octahedral there were six ligands so 4 by 6 means roughly 2 by 3 a factor of 2 by 3 is coming from this factor that only four ligands instead of six right and then and then instead of approaching directly in this case none of the orbital none of the ligand is facing any of the orbitals directly they are everything at an angle right some at 35 degree angle some at 40, 40 50 40 degree angle none of them is facing none of the d orbital is facing any ligand directly right so again the splitting will be less right repulsion will be less so again a 2 by 3 factor is coming from here therefore delta t is 2 by 3 into 2 by 3 that means 4 by 9 of delta o in fact this figure of 4 by 9 is coming is coming from the experimental values this is how it is explained experimental if you see the splitting in the tetrahedral in splitting of the same metal just having more uh, ligands uh, octahedral field splitting will be about 4 by 9 of delta o that is why this is the way to explain how the factor of 4 by 9 is coming so as a result all tetrahedral complexes are high spin since the cfsc crystal field is splitting energy not stabilization we'll come to stabilization now. crystal field splitting energy normally is smaller than the pairing energy we will understand all these terms slowly slow. hence low spin configuration are rarely observed usually if a very strong ligand field is present the square spinner geometry will be favored instead of going for a instead of going for a tetrahedral geometry the ligand field is strong then we will have a square planar geometry all right so what we have understood here we have understood we have understood uh, that what are the assumption of the crystal field theory how we get the splitting in the octahedral field and how we get splitting in the tetrahedral field right and uh, we will have many other geometries that we will be discussing in our next video okay so let me stop over here so all right so if you have understood please pay attention over here that uh, we have understood the assumption of the crystal field theory which are basically you need to understand the shape of the d orbitals uh, first if you understand the shape of the d orbitals right then you'll be understanding from which side ligands are approaching right like in case of octahedral they are approaching uh, from the directly along the axis so the orbitals which are along the axis those orbitals will be affected more right their energy will be high other orbitals which are not affected their energy will be low right in case of a tetrahedral we have seen none of the 5d orbital is facing the ligands directly right so their splitting is much less compared to the water the splitting we have seen in case of the octahedral field right it's, it's like 4 by 9 of the delta o right so you will see in next class uh, some more uh, geometries like square planar right trigonal bipyramidal trigonal square planar right we will discuss those geometries and then we will summarize how the splitting and how the splitting diagram of the various d orbitals in different geometries looks like that is our uh, next time okay with that uh, just uh, i suggest you please go through the uh, please go through this uh,